Hello, I'm Giulia Zacchia, young feminist economist based in Italy, a member of the AFI Young Scholar Committee. Uh, welcome to Feminist Economy Economics 101, where young scholars chat with senior scholars. Today I'm with Antonella Picchio, a pioneer in the analysis of social reproduction with her 1992 book, Social Reproduction, The Political Economy on Labor Market by Cambridge University Press, she opened new direction for economic analysis that grounded on the history of economic thought, a look at the relationship between the process of production of commodities and the process of social reproduction of laboring population. So my first question to Antonella is, uh, what has been your contribution to economics and how it relates to feminist economics. Okay. Well, my contribution is still the one going on. It's always the same in different tools and different perspectives. That is that the social reproduction of the laboring population and of population in general is a fundamental process of the economic structure and as such has to be seen and locate placed in the, in the framework, which is not. And that is very much to do with feminism because the social reproduction, the complexity of this process is, is rooted in the complexity of the human animal and of the human body, which is a vulnerable body more vulnerable than other animals as Smith and Marx and all the 18th century and 19th century authors would say, because it doesn't run fast, doesn't fly and so on, doesn't, is not satisfied with the cave and has a delicacy of mind that suffers for the matching of colors, although also birds suffer for the matching of colors and so on. And so that was the root of that complexity of the human animal was the root of the major scientific program of the 18th century on which the political economy program is rooted. I mean, after the 17th century in which science had been studying the animal world, the vegetal, the plants world and the sky they thought they could study and have a scientific approach to the human animal. That was the whole objective of the effort. It has to be a scientific effort. But the scientific science was not intended as a simplification, as a, a mystification of reality. And then being in love with tools instead of, of the sense of the inquiry. So, I mean, for instance, the founding father, Adam Smith, was a multidisciplinary author, able of grasping um, all the sciences, the moral sciences, the story, history, the anthropology, and so on, in order to say something relevant about the human animal. So the, the, so the, what has that to do with feminism? A lot, because feminists, the feminist movement have been taken to the forefront, the body, the body of a, as women know it, their own body and the other's body, the children, the old people, but also the men's body, because the men delegate the care of their body into the family, into they delegate to women, they make them responsible for their security. And in a sense, they don't face their vulnerability, normal human vulnerability. And that becomes an intimate problem dealt at, the, at intimate level in the family. And that is a source of tragedy very often because the fear of losing that, that help in life is taking men also the best ones to not reasonable then behavior. So, I mean, feminist has a lot to do to move the ground of the scientific scope of 
economics and feminist needs economics because the whole thing is how you structure production and social reproduction in a sustainable way and in equal in equal and in a fair way responsible way able to deal with the needs of women and with respect to women and with the safety of women so at the core we always have to do with the social reproduction structure and where it's placed in society. So I think the two things, at least for my feminism, they always went together. So thank you so much. And I mean, you gave us a broad perspective of social reproduction and even nutshell. I mean, uh, how do you think feminists and economics uh, can fit together? You already say something about, I mean, just uh, in, in a nutshell. How can they stay together? Yes, how feminism and economics can fit together and stay together. Yes, yes. Feminism can't fit without having a system that at the end solve the problem of a fair social reproduction, sustainable social reproduction, and ethical social reproduction, and so on, and a happy social reproduction for men and women, for women and men first. <laughs> and the children. I mean, we all know that the relations depend from the environment and how you relate to the others and how free you are to relate to the others. So the feminism and, and the economics of it are very important, but we are so far from it. And economics need desperately now a radical change because we are at a, at a very basic restructuring is necessary. I think that we really are not aware how deep the restructuring needs to be, how radical it needs to be. And again, the founding fathers can help because Smith had this idea of the basic stages of development from based exactly on the relationship between production and reproduction. Subsistence, the way you Reproduce a population is, is a test to know how the system works and to qualify the system. So you had hunting, where you, uh, the people subsist on hunting. And when you can't hunt anymore, you in a sense pass to a system of uh, raising, I mean, how you say, grow animals. In, and so you have the meat in other ways and you have it all the year. In fact, in the fable of, of Robinson Crusoe, nobody noticed that he passes through those stages. He goes hunting and then he can hunt in the winter and so on. And so he, he raises a, a goat, a, a wild animal, and then he eats it. So he passes from one system to the other. And, so, and then he grows grain and so on. So he himself grows through the various stages anyway. And then finally has some a slave to, to use for the work. So it's the final stage. But anyway, the production reproduction is uh, defines the quality and the sustainability of the system. So that is, and in fact, we have to get to the basic of this of our system which is a capitalist system. And capitalist system, which is, means that not only is based on trade, because the market was always there since the beginning. I mean, we find the exchange of bases of materials and so on. So the markets were always there as Polanyi has thought. Of. But also that, but the real thing in the capitalist system is that the market is the market for labor very special commodity, which is not men, their bodies as well for the slaves. And in fact, there is a conflict between the labor market, which labor market and the slave labor market, a historical conflict in the, in the, in the 18th century and in, in 19th century too, because there's a trade for slave. The slave trade was forbidden in the, 18th, in the 19th century. And when the, the, the states found the ships with the slave during the, the when was forbidden, 
the, the, the merchants would actually drown the, 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 the slaves or abandon on a desert island. So they were not caught with a forbidden commodity in their hands and so on. So, I mean, this presence of a slave market at the beginning of the wage labor market is very important. It's not only just an event in the American uh, civil war, but it was a very important conflict at the, at the moment. And in fact, the English trader and the English owners, landowners were no longer own, owning slaves or serfs, but were owning, were still trading with slaves in, in the colonies. So, I mean, it's a whole, but the wage labor market is not, you don't own the body, you don't know the family of the slave, but you own the cap capability to work. And the capability to work, capability is the work. The labor force, the, even the Marxian term of labor force in German means is a, is an Aristotelian term. Because it's in fact a capability, a potential, something that you use, you put to use. But how much you use it depends how much you, you have fed that person, you have not only in terms of food, but also in terms of feelings, of sentiments, of relationships, of sense. Because otherwise you, they wouldn't be able to work. Again, you need some, some sensibility to find this thing. I have been reading this many times. And only very, I mean, quite recently I found this reference that when he's talking about the fact that you have to have public education for the workers, the state in educating, having a problem of education, he says, because hey, you have to educate the, the tender feelings that are necessary for the social life and for the family life, I mean, for the intimate life. Otherwise, as the soldiers, the Greek soldiers, who fight the whole day for life with, uh, with their body, need not only to have gym, gymnastic, and train the body, but also to have music, train the tender feeling. So, I mean, this, this fact that the body is always a social, a social entity, is a space, is a material. But that materialism has to be sentimental, ethical, anthropological, social, because the body is a space in time, is a place, it occupies place, it's in a specific historic time and in a territorial context. That was clear from the beginning. For instance, how you reproduce the race of the, labor, of the laboring population, and the term used by all of them was race. You have to do some demography accountings. As Miss would say, well, you need four children, because half of them die. So to reproduce the parents, you need four children. But the pampered bourgeois women, women need to have only two children because there is a less death rate. So, I mean, the whole thing was very clear that the social reproduction was a fundamental process, so much so that the wages were defined by the social reproduction, by the cost of social reproduction. Marx says, what is the high wage? A wage that reproduces social reproduction norms. Doesn't mean that the wage is constant, because we know that can be reduced, but it is normal. That means as some norms, anthropological, some common laws, some common behavior that accepts certain standards. And that is what is a long period position of Garignani in a sense. The fact that some norms 
actings in a long period, you can change them, but you have to change all the framework to change them. But now we can accept the wages of the of the run, I mean, what's the radius of the one that run? Because so much has been destroyed of all the defense of the, and the rights that you can accept such a low wages. You are going back to slaves in a sense. And that's because, not because you, it's a flexible productivity or, or quantitative relationship with supply and demand but because the whole power relationships have changed. So that is my contribution in a sense to the discipline, to take back the roots of the classical political economy in all their wealth and complexity and so on, using the attention of the families on the body and on conflict and on tension. And the fact that distribution is a major political issue and that was, has been taken out again by Zarafa. That solving a problem of measure took out again that the measure of profit can be done without showing that there is a conflict between wages and profit. And that wages are a subsistence in a subsistence system. Then he talks about profit because the power relationship were in favor of profit and the rate of interest. And all this ruffian to totally didn't care about subsistence, thinking that subsistence was just the limit, not the normal wage. While it is the normal wage, doesn't mean that it's a general, but that is sedimented in time by power relationships. And also that the conflict and that the classical economy showed very clear that the conflict is on the distribution of surplus. And to know surplus, you have to know the social reproduction costs, product minus the social reproduction cost. And so, and rent is a surplus and profit is a surplus. So there is also a conflict between profit and, and rent which at the times of the classical was a real profit, a real conflict in, in action, because there had been a revolution again in England against the king, and the head of the king had been cut by the, by the bourgeois figure of the rank of the, of the, what to say, doesn't come the one who rents the land and produce. Oh, he's not the owner, he's not the worker, he's the farmer, the farmer who rents the land and had a conflict with the owner of the, of the land. But, and there had been in England a revolution on that. And in, in France, the physiocrats were dealing with that fear of revolution and having the head of the king to be cut as it was, because the proposal of reform by the physiocrats was not enough. But the physiocrats, in fact, showed the whole macro foundations of macroeconomics, including the conflict on distribution, where nobody had their productivity, nobody, because the rent had the power of the property. The, the, the farmer had what was needed for to, to produce the capital, and the capital was the social reproduction of the laborers who had their own subsistence. So nobody had what were they produced, but they all they had what they could have by power relationships. And it's, it's, that was happening now. Nobody can say that the financial capital is producing all the wealth that is in is grabbing, uh, or that also profit is all producing the surplus, and that the product in all this jargon of merit or productivity and so on to to keep wages down is absolutely jargon nothing to do with what really happened in power relationships. And that also takes us to feminism, which kind of feminist we need. We need a very radical feminist 
because the whole system is collapsing. And we, we see the system collapsing because we are, our eyes see more than anybody else because we are at the bottom sustaining everything. So we know the, what is breaking down and it's breaking down everywhere in any sense because the environment is broken down, the relationships are breaking down, the wars are spreading because the markets for arms is the most profitable. You know? And so the whole, the, we are in a dramatic situation and we have to get out with drastic radical forms and no, no wages, I mean, well, now I, say, I think we have to go on to another question. But I think that the women are now a global movement, which is very difficult to define because it's very varied and so on, but it's global. And it started to be global at Beijing, at the NGO Forum in Beijing. And, uh, and this global movement is putting down some clear focus. For instance, all the attention on care now is clear. All the myths about getting into the labor market as substitution of the unwaged labor work, unpaid work. We know that we don't substitute, we just double it. Or we organize with two other people work. So, I mean, we know that we need some drastic reforms and not just not even not pretending to give some money to some people, but not to others, and then to uh, improve the this, this health system after we dis destroyed it for decades and we don't really know. And we think that if they are, we treat them as heroes, we solve the problem. Well, we may know that, I mean, we can teach very well that we are not infinitely sacrificing. We are not heroes, we want just to be, that people see what we do and respect what we do. And also we have to decide, we can have to be able to decide what we want to do and don't want to do. So it's not, we are not as infinitely sacrificing as Diane Nelson said, subject. And we even pretend to be infinitely sacrificing. We know that in our lives, we very may often pretend to be omnipotent, but that is a myth. And it's better we get out at least collectively in an organized movement instead of struggling by our own and being feeling guilty if we are not infinitely able to solve the problem of any way I can have to stop. So thank you so much. And I really think that uh, actually we have to act collectively as a, co as a collective. But, uh, and in that way, I mean, uh, we have different kinds of feminism, uh, uh, different kind of feminism. But uh, what I ask you is, um, in your view, uh, how has feminist economics evolved in the last 20, 10 years? Have you seen some changes from, I mean, the beginning? And I mean, does this uh, revolutionary uh, flavor of, uh, uh, of feminist economics is evolving, is blowing up? Or, I mean, have you seen something that is stopping in some way out? Which is your vision? Well, 20 years is very little short time. Uh, so that would say, you would ask me, how did it evolve from Beijing conference on? Yeah, so Feminine let's start from started, there. Feminine has started about 20 years before that. I, I make for myself, Feminine started in 2071. And uh, 71 was, it, was the year I'd gone, not that I became feminist, but in which I joined a feminist group. I had gone to York, to the University of York with two children, one of two and one of three for doing a master and at that point I also decided that my brain I had only one brain little time to use it 
and I would put it together, my feminist ideas and my economics idea, academic e economics. And so I wrote this master thesis on the critique of the Lewis model as a wage, as a subsistence wage determined by an excessive supply of labor. Anyway, and so he was, this was called a Ricardian theory of wage, uh, wage. And I was, I criticized the fact that it wasn't a Ricardian because it was just an excessive supply, so it was still supply and demand. And that was a downward rigidity of wages, it was a rigidity, not a normal determination. And in Ricardo was a normal determination of wages and was done by, and so on. That's how I start leading classical theory wages. And that was again my way of finding a place for my feminism into the into the theory. Because social reproduction allowed me to put, put all the effort I was putting with the two small children in a class of, of boys that had no children. And a university who gave me a flat, but didn't send it the cleaner what whom they sent to the boys in the flats near me because I had the children. So I had to clean my own flat while the boys needed to have somebody cleaning their flat, that kind of things. And when I was going to the library, you know, and meeting my colleagues at the, in the class and say, oh, I saw you with the two children on campus and I envied you. And I said, well, I envied you, you going to the library. And I was pushing this push chair with the two children, the laundry, the, the shopping and so on. And then studying in the night and that kind of things. In fact, I came back to Ferrara saying, well, I know what emancipation is. Now I want to have other things. And in York, I met Selma James. And that was also very important because then when I came back to Ferrara, there was a meeting in Padova, the second meeting on discussing power of women, subversion of the community, the meeting where Antonio Negri and others of Pero Caraio were thrown out. And uh, we had, they called me from Padova in the afternoon and said, we have a meeting tonight and I managed to put four or five people in my room, in my car and went to Padova to that meeting and all that. Everything started on that. I mean, a movement that has organization, has connections, has discussions. And I was lucky because the discussions were with Selma, with Maria Rosa, and with Silvia Federici, so were very interesting. Although I think that the idea of the social reproduction was original, because it was in my article, the one I was writing, and I gave it to, I had written an article on the 8th of March of 71, very badly with a lot of English mistakes because the girl who had to edit it decided it was more, more ni nicer to publish with my mistakes instead of correcting them. So it was a very, very bad art. But it was all the idea that we reproduce the labor force and so on. And gave it to Selma, whom I couldn't hear go to listen because I had the children and the babysitter went. And then I invited her for lunch and gave him my article and that, that's why they invited me to the meeting and so on. So the link between the feminist movement and, and my developing of my contribution to economics is very, very straight, strict. My English is disappearing. No, it's fine, really fine. And have you seen, I mean, uh, recently some changes in uh, the movement uh, or, I mean, uh, new, new idea coming up uh, or yes. something that is evolving or, I mean, is still uh, the discussion there? No, I think that is, well, uh, the change is that the unpaid work is to the forefront now and wasn't because it was something that the feminist movement didn't want to hear. I remember 
that was something because everybody was trying to escape and even nobody wanted to hear it. And the, the connection with money was so, so to be totally, totally repulsive. And that is one thing. But also, I mean, I think that the whole equal opportunity perspective that is to map all the inequality between men and women, do the list of the inequalities and try to do something has shown that it doesn't lead to very much because it solves some problems of what is called the, uh, the crystal roof. I mean, the fact that women don't go up. Some now go up. But as I always say, the problem is not that they don't go up, but they stay down as at the bottom, the, the concrete bottom floor, and they sustain everything. And also the equal opportunity is now very something that is, I would say, I, I don't want to, I mean, everybody does what they can and they what I don't judge, but it's really not changing anything because to have some women in some places doesn't help. I mean, I'm glad for them. I is natural for me, it's not that the way I like them there. Some of them are really too dependent. Too. But it's also the fact that it's not enough. You have really to work on the floor, on the ground, because it's there where they have the power to transform society and to see what is going on. Because, and in fact, that's why what wages for the housework gave me, the struggle of the black women in London that for them was clear there was a problem of money, for instance, because they had no money and they were going, working in hospital, doing care for hours and then going back and have care for their children. It was clear for them there was the same work, but they couldn't stand another shift of care and so on. And that clarity comes from experience not from studying or analyzing or that thing. I mean, you need to have the clarity of somebody who lives uh, and we are not only a complex, but we are an intersectional movement, but we have to work through the sections. But I think that after Beijing, this, this fact that we are a global movement is coming out quite clear. I mean, for instance, in my work, the fact that I, I'm seeing you instead of me now is much nicer. <laughs> the fact that, what I was saying? Sorry, today I had a bad day. Yes, you, say, you were saying that uh, after Beijing, she said something that was clear that there was a global movement, because that has been the highest level of, of negotiations between the feminist movement and the governments. And the fact that in a sense, we didn't put ourselves as national movements. We were all facing our governments in the same way. I mean, negotiating with them and being detached from them. And also it happens that in Beijing, we had clarity on the, on the question of unpaid work, on counting. And that was important because that was the most hottest political issue at the conference. The one that we couldn't close till the last day of the conference. And I know because the, the conflict was between Europe and other countries and the southern countries and so on because Sweden and Dan and Denmark and France and the unions didn't want to mention unpaid work because they were afraid it was asking for money, which in fact they were right. But the problem was at that point was only to measure, that means to put a symbol. But they didn't want the symbol because they were afraid that would actually, and that would actually decrease the emancipation of their policy. And that was very strong conflict. I know because it happens that I was put in the Italian delegation 
20 days before the conference by the Catholic members of the delegation, uh, La Rodano and others, communist Catholic. And uh, I remember, the, and there was a, the, the Spanish Alberti, I think was called, they told me, you do whatever you can to pass. The, the words for accounting and paid work in money and in, in physical units, but having Sweden to be to control, to be annoyed by it. So we managed to do it because we Selma James, we organized a seminar for the delegation. We negotiate and so on. And we negotiated with this graph of the UNDP um, year, I mean, the, uh, tonight, I'm too tired because today I had a morning that was very troublesome. Um, the, uh, the official number publication of UNDP, the Human Development Report of 95, that came out in August, just two weeks before the conference. And I had written a paper for that. And they had a very good picture, very effective. Was it a, 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 a picture of the total work? First of all, they were nominating total work, paid and unpaid, men and women, with a diagonal showing the difference between men and women. But what was more important was the difference between paid, total paid, and total unpaid. And it showed no was something that nobody of us would have known that the total unpaid is more than the total paid. So the total work that sustains the total paid work is more than, than I mean, total, than total paid. In fact, Australia started counting that key cooking and cleaning is, is all an industry. I mean, it's incredible data. And that, I mean, is very effective. And then the five years, I mean, I don't know what happens, by the way, the time use in Italy. I haven't heard that it came out. Yes, actually, one. we have it. And, but, uh, but, I, but has the recent one come out? No, actually, it's the 2014, I think. But uh, they should have a new release. But uh, I mean, actually, we don't have this. Uh, no, but uh, have to check, because otherwise. As it is a very expensive survey, they are trying to undermine it. Yes, that is the problem. But actually, I think that are so useful. And actually, I mean, we use the time use survey, and it's, I mean, it's something that we we should, I mean, once more struggle for uh, this kind of data and to have this uh, available. It's showing oh. that one man and woman do, for instance, more housework, the woman, if they are single, the woman works more than the man. But then if they go in couple, the woman works a double and the man works up. And that the increase of working for women is more for the husband, for having a in couple with a man than with a child of more than one year. And, for, and then the adult children in the house cost more than a small child. You know, these things, nobody would know it, but the ones who do it and don't dare to say it. So it's, and that has been a Beijing product. And I remember when at the end uh, it passed in the General Assembly because it didn't pass in the committee, was a whole, applause by everybody. And then it was strange because both Selma James and the Swedish came to thank us for how we had negotiated it. <laughs> so we don't know. How it... <laughs> so all... thank you for this negotiation. I mean, actually, <laughs> we uh, we have now this data thanks to you, of yes, course, and I, your negotiation. My, so thank you so much. My <laughs> only official role was really nice. But what's fundamental? So actually, thank you so much because actually we are working hard also for that's the fact that now everybody talks about care and unpaid work, and have you and this idea of the gen universal 
and unconditional care income is a very good idea. Yes, absolutely. And uh, I mean, uh, right now with the COVID-19, it's even more urgent to speak about that, I think. To be the radical request at the global level. Yes, global and radical and I mean, should be prioritized by all the political issues. By the way, I just, uh, I mean, an other uh, question that we had, I mean, the fine is that, I mean, about institutions. And so actually also remembering that you have been vice president of the YAFI. What role has YAFI, so the institution played and organization and the association played in your career development? When I saw this question, I laughed, I uh, smiled because I would answer not at all in the, my career, because in my career, Yafi didn't, but in my life has been important. The vice presidency has been only a, because I was made vice president the year I joined Yafi, because Elitabeta, this dear friend who died, uh, who had introduced me to Yafi at the tour conference, because my name and was made vice president, a role that I didn't know what it was. I didn't do anything as vice president. I did a little bit more as editor of the journal, but so I didn't do much for the institution. Although I enjoyed very much the friends, the good scholars, the conferences for me has been as myself very important for the career. No, nobody would notice it. I don't think they would praise it. But uh, the one thing, one thing, I don't know if it's been Yafi or more, the fact that I've been translated in Spanish because Cristina Carrasco, who I don't think was Yafi at the moment, that I noticed uh, an article on Quaderni uh, dell'Economia del Lavoro, I think it was the beginning. And she thought it was interesting, or always about wages, uh, social reproduction, and so on. I can't remember the title. I meant to look my CV to it, but I can't remember it now. And she asked to translate it, and that to be translated in Spanish is much more important than to be translated into English. And so this I have been much more popular in Latin America than actually, I always say that feminist economics didn't review my book, which had been done by the economic journal a few months after my idea coming out of my book. The feminist economics never did it. So, but it wasn't so, but feminist, YAF has been fundamental in the sense uh, as, putting a piece on my bits of, of brain of the pleasure of the brain of women's intelligence and the conferences and the places of the conferences and so on. So. So thank you so much. And I think that the Italian academics wouldn't notice at all. And this is still the case, I, <laughs> coming from Italy and working the here, thing is, I, it's the still only there. The relationship with the name feminist, that in Italy it is still difficult to be used. Yeah, it's still difficult to say feminist, so yeah, you correct. have to hide with the gender, so <laughs> maybe something that is more accepted, but not feminist, but <laughs> still, I mean, it's in the Italian. Journal, that is well referenced, so that is a good thing. And also the thing that you do, because then in my CV, you had a lot of things that were strange for the Italian academics. The fact I was called, called invited, for instance, a word here in some development, which I thought I was in, uh, the once day I was in New York teaching at the new school I was visiting. I had a call from Italy, from New York, saying, oh, we were looking for you in Italy, but we didn't, couldn't find it. They told us you're here. We'd like to invite you at the World Year and Soul Development. I thought, well, if they invite me, it would be something, my level. Arrived there, there was Nierere, spoke before me, then Klein, 
So I was, I said, my problem was, whom did they invite me? <laughs> they were asking, whom did they invite me? <laughs> so these kind of things, and that has been the feminist network, I imagine. That's why I got into the Human Development Report after, because I had made a contribution at the end that the UN journal said the day after, said Italian economy storms the General Assembly Assembly. <laughs> yeah, it's quite strange, uh, Damien, uh, for, for Italian the traditional curricula. <laughs> the committee that judged my work, academic work, after having failed me when they passed me, they thought I uh, well, had a strange career, in fact. That was due to the feminist network and the strange things that I was doing and the fact that I was a good teacher and that my students loved me. You can imagine, yeah. So my last question, I mean, it's really related also to students and so to the younger uh, feminist economists. And uh, I mean, which is your advice uh, for young scholars who are at the beginning of their career? If you have any advice, of course, but I, actually, I think that... Actually, to answer this, this question, I, 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 I read what I wrote here. Enjoy and food to test your brain, find friends to discuss with, respect yourself against intellectual harassment. That's what it came out, my question, answer to the young. And also, as I will say, dare to, to risk to fail. Get ready to fail. Don't be destroyed by be failing. So don't, but don't close the door in front of you. Let other people close the door. If you like to, like to pass it, try to pass it. Don't let the people. Do other, let at least the job, let it to the other. Don't do it yourself. And also, don't accept to obey and to be remissive to bosses of various type. And, uh, and dare to see, to have your ideas. Feminism will give you enough ideas to challenge your brain and to find places how to say things and and, uh, and don't be alone, discuss with the others, find that has been a community very important to me. So in a sense... Yes, I, and it I'm is something to... that, that we are trying to do also in our young uh, community. For a career because I, I was so... Since I was at school, I must say, I was a very bad student. I was a good student, an excellent student, only when I had a teacher that I really liked and so on. So, I mean, the whole career is a difficult path. I did find people that helped me. One is John Eatwell. I remember I went to talk about housework and he understood and he was sympathetic. And then uh, even Zraf, I remember one, who would remember anything. And I would ask you every five minutes, who are you? And he would uh, try to say it in a different way and so on. One day I started with some paid housework and he went on for half an hour <laughs> making questions. So, uh, in a sense. So, I mean, and I must say, at the end, help me more powerful men and intelligent men than women, because women are too afraid of your weakness. So whenever you get strong, they support you, but if you're weak, they're afraid to be caught in your weakness. And so it's difficult that they really help you. Hope that change, I hope that the things are changing up changing also in that direction, but yeah. <laughs> by the way, yeah. I hope so. <laughs> yeah, we can be, in fact, I see a lot of places now with this, in the mail arrive a lot of work opening of positions. It looks as their communities really working in. 
Yes, and actually, I really love. I mean, uh, your I'm, I will quote your your definition of intellectual harassment. I really love this. Yes, I think it's fantastic. Really, we also, uh, had, we also found some uh, sexual harassment. I remember once in in uh, in uh, we had in Padua a summer course in Bressanone. And one evening that we had a social evening with the faculty, the head of the faculty and so on. One professor, I was going out, came, called me. And there was two, three steps. He called me, I turned my head. And he asked, he offered his, the key of his room in front of everybody. And I just pushed him down the stairs and then looked ahead of the faculty who actually was smiling at me in a, I remember the scene. Anyway. So thank you so much, Antonella, and for this I mean, wonderful chat. I just remember uh, to all uh, you that uh, you can watch all the other videos of uh, uh, the Feminist Economics 101 uh, series on Yaffe YouTube channel. And thank you I want and once more, um, and Antonella, for this. Thank you. Something that I didn't say, what feminists can do for economics. Oh, if you want to add something, yes. I mean, actually, we start, we, we can, I mean, afterward, I think we can tap, we can cut and uh, pass. So if you want to say something uh, more about that. No, I think that the feminists can give the radical perspective of a subject that has political and wants to change the situation in a practical way and has to deal with an experiential knowledge and so it's also the scientific method that changes changes clears the focus that is the body and the perspective which is a, the sustainability and the social reproduction and so on and the um, and the scientific inquiry, the method of scientific inquiry. So I mean, it's really a challenge that the feminism has to do at different levels. It has the power to do it. So, so thank you so much. Yes, quite impressive. So thank you once more, Antonella, and uh, I stop the recording here. Okay. <laughs>